It's time once again for Two Women Talking. I am Leanna. I'm here with Song W. Erickson, Tomboy, and Girly Girl. I got the order right that time. And we're <laughs> continuing our conversation on criticism. What's valid, what's not, how to handle it, how not to handle it, so on and so forth. And last week, we said we were going to talk about two things. Well, Taylor Swift, we keep circling around Taylor Swift. <laughs> like Taylor Swift is going to be final boss in this conversation. I can guarantee it. <laughs> That's but perfect. <laughs> we, we also talked about the she-ra netflix show and i stuck a pin in that because song and i have not talked about this before i have no idea what she's gonna say but we i have had... actually once <laughs> okay because i had my issues with it and i didn't i didn't think that the this is one of those ones where i truly believe the legitimate critiques of the show got buried in the bullshit and so I understand the frustration of people who think that happens on other things. And so I think that might be a good jump off point to talk about that. But Song, what issues did you have with the she show? Really quick, though, I just want to say, I think it's funny. We're two redheads talking about a couple blondes. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe that's the grudge, right? Maybe that's the grudge. No, I, I, no, uh... no I, I remember hearing a joke once that redheads are just blondes with high blood pressure. Yeah, there are so many damn redhead jokes joke. and and i, I think that, that one. i think that's maybe why i have a higher threshold for that kind of i don't get offended as easily as some because i've heard it freaking all <laughs> man like if one more person tells me i'm angry when i'm laughing <laughs> it, it it just it, the other one is you're nicer on youtube it's like well youtube i get to talk to like one other person or by myself uninterrupted and I get to say what I want to say I don't have assholes putting words in my mouth in 240 characters gee maybe that's why you know <laughs> like but see if I do that for a fact even though I laugh afterwards it's, oh you're angry so <laughs> I, I mean I do who is it um uh what's her name who did She-Ra Noelle Neal is that her name eh, not my favorite person is that who it is though yeah I believe so yeah yeah I mean I I try to be I try because I get I get the sense that she's one that isn't so good at hearing feedback. OK, I I will just say this. I believe Noelle uses she her pronouns. They might be they them. Yeah, I'm not sure anymore. So I'm going to apologize. Now. Let, I'll look it up <laughs> while you talk. OK, uh, yeah. so it, Noelle has a very Tumblr look. Uh -huh. and the art style is very tumblr as well and i think that that was a big disadvantage Wait, that's not her name noelle neal is a woman who played lois lane in the original superman well at least we know where you got it yeah i completely okay so let's um i'm looking it up keep talking i'm looking it okay. up. oh no uh, oh now nd stevenson okay they have changed their their name oh my goodness he it's a he oh, now. So okay. Fanny Noel Stevenson, Andy or Nate. So he. Okay. okay. Well, oh wait, Shira was made by a guy. <clears throat> that explains so fucking much. They, they are trans. I'm. But they... but that explains a lot about the show. That does actually, because so the big criticism when the show was announced is it's like. I love the design of original She-Ra and people have compared her to a Barbie. Um, nah. Also just, I mean, like it, blonde, curvy. I She reminded me more of Wonder Woman from the Super Friends back in the yes. day. And I mean, that was my era. I was not a She-Ra fan. I was into He-Man, but yeah. Uh, much... You were also the one who changed the heads on your sister's Barbies. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> just because that was cool and made them more interesting. <laughs> I put them back, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, there, there was a distinct lack of feminine experience in the Shira show. So, and oh gosh, I will get to that. Okay, so we had an older Shira. I don't. They never specifically say how old she was in the yeah. original, but I think she's like nineteen twenty. That that was the sense I got. Yeah. Yeah, and. Then we get the remake where I think she's 12. Yeah. 
maybe 16. She looked 12. And there was a joke about, yeah, it, she I, looked like a 12 year old boy. I thought she was 14, but we're in the same ballpark. Yeah, I think it was 14. Yeah. So, and the curves are gone. The design now has the shorts. Yeah. And the shoulder, oh, it has sleeves now. Well, not quite sleeves, but it goes over the shoulder. Um, and a lot of people, especially male fans of the old, but also female fans of the original, like myself, were like, okay, but we liked the design. We liked the original and that she was attractive, conventionally attractive. Mm-hmm. And people, the response I would see a lot of people make was, well, this is a 14-year-old. Are you saying you want a 14-year-old to be sexualized? And I'm like, oh. no, that is not what I'm saying at all but it also comes back to this issue i have with a lot of remakes i've seen and a lot of modern shows because it's like back in the 80s we had shows with these characters who were already older they were older Mm -hmm. teens they were adults and Mm -hmm. um thundercats was different because you know it's lino who's a child in an adult body so problematic today so problematic uh, uh what is a 13 year old in the body of a man or a six like oh my god yeah oh <laughs> whatever field i love my thundercats but that that was one of those western cartoons that was very japanese influenced and you can see it yes they actually did an anime style reboot back in like 2012 i think well, Thundercats uh, Roar was that weird Cal art uh, style. That, yeah, that. So, I mean, that that's where I connected to the Shiva no, no, fans that, who were disappointed. Was that yeah, it? No, that's a, there's a different one. Um, so that was like 2018, 2019 mm-hmm. or so was Thundercats Roar, but there was an anime esque one. It only went for one or two seasons, in like 2012 oh, okay. or something. Uh, probably about the same time they redid, uh, they did the He Man. Oh, okay. That, I know there was a comics line in the early 2000s about that time because it was dark. Yeah, no, like, not like that. Yeah. Um, it, it was a more serious take because it was the 2000s. Yeah. But yeah, so, but for the most part, it was adult characters who were emulating maturity and who were learning yeah. lessons, but they were ones that kids could learn from as well. Whereas nowadays, oftentimes we have shows about kids... God, I don't want to bring up Steven Universe, but we're halfway there already. Yes, I feel like we've been circling around that one. So when I first watched the first few episodes of Steven Universe, I I messaged a friend who'd watched it and I said, how old is Steven supposed to be? And she said, I think he's like eight. Yep. And then a few, not too long later, he's 14. Okay. Which he's so juvenile. Yeah. And but so we get so many shows where it's like, oh, it's a young kid. And it's as you've talked about, four kids in a backyard. Well, I don't think you can get as much from four kids in a backyard as you can get from Prince Adam or Princess Adora who are learning how to be adults. Right. And like even when they dubbed the Sailor Moon show, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Deke, I think was the brand that did the first dub, as bad as it was, you know, it still ended with oh, learning to be a princess is about more than just wearing pretty dresses. It's learning to be responsible, which is very American to shove it down your throat like right, that. Right, right. But if, <laughs> if you don't do it, they don't get it. Yes, it's still a lesson. Yeah. And not even, and I'm not even advocating for like, oh, it has to have a moral. Just watching characters grow. And I just didn't get, I didn't watch Netflix she because I don't hate myself. <laughs> I watched the first season. I, I saw the designs and I'm like, this doesn't appeal to me. I don't like this art style. I don't like these designs. I would much rather have the original She-Ra design. You know, what's, I, hmm. you know what's weird about that is after all of that, um, the less conventionally attractive princesses were portrayed in the first season as the loser princesses. And there was this weird hierarchy about the whole thing. And it was it was very clearly um, Nate Stevenson casting himself as, you know, glimmer as self insert and making She-Ra's bestie the center of the show. Um, From what I understand, behaving extremely immaturely. 
the whole thing was very that kind of uh, it, I I need a term for this particular kind of animation because it's that everything is very loud and yelling and oh my god I am making a big deal so everybody knows oh it's funny you know no 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 stop stop it was yeah stop. but you know what I'm talking about right oh I do yeah and so that but you know they had plus size princesses and everybody freaked out before but they were treated like junk mm -hmm. and so there was still this sort of traditional beauty hierarchy and that's what drives me crazy about a lot of these rethinks no and, matter you know, go ahead at, at least adora and she wrote in the original show they were still feminine like there's absolutely nothing masculine about her even as she's kicking ass and I like that. Whereas we have this 14 year old remake Adora, who's a tomboy. No offense to you. Well, because it was made by a man. Yeah, clearly. It was made time, by man brain. Like, come okay, on. No one knew that at the time, though. Because you I've could been, tell it, watching it because the two best characters were what's his name? Bo. Bo was adorable. Mm -hmm. And then Seahawk. Oh my God, that guy stole every episode he was in the netflix what's that you're talking about the netflix version yeah the netflix version okay yeah it was the the guy stole the show which is so odd because like it was supposed to be this feminist remake that was and supposed to this, undo the unhealthy this, idealization yeah this was my issue with it it was the everything feminine was so toxic the catra scorpia thing scorpio was adorable oh my god but he also Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the big ship being Catra and Adora. And it's like, do you have any idea the toxicity there? Well, but also, I mean, Catra looked really good in that magenta suit, not gonna lie. And I'm like, this is a fucking cartoon. Why am I going there? <laughs> and is that is that sexualizing a cartoon for kids? I'd argue no, because a kid is not going to respond to it on that level. I also think there's a difference between making something that looks good versus sexualizing it. Well, and yeah, I there's a difference in beauty and sexuality, right? Exactly. Like there are so many people who I think are, are very pretty, but not sexy. And then I know, you know, I know people who are not conventionally beautiful, but they got it going on, <laughs> right? And yeah. they're different things. And the, the thing that bothered me about She-Ra is it was the princesses of power, but it just seemed to be at war with the feminine the entire time. Yeah. And I see that in so many things where it's just, there's well, so a much. Well, just... a not out trans man made it. Like I said, this makes, I can now put that makes so to bed. Much sense. Oh my God, it makes so much sense. So much sense. Just, okay, I'm good. Okay, yeah, now I, I understand. Yeah. But, I mean, there is also this thing in, okay, uh, I don't like Twiggy. The and 60s I was, model? The 60s model. Okay, yeah. I resent Twiggy <laughs> because it, it could be argued that her skinny 12-year-old looking yeah. figure led to the heroin chic. Well, led to it was the piece. people who pushed it, right? Yes. Yeah. But you know, she was the trendsetter. She was well, maybe, she was the figurehead for it. Yeah, she better. she she was the face, right? Yeah. She was the face, she was the body, but there were sort of overall trends. I mean, that's another period where people were sort of um, you know, the idea of the problematic feminine, that the idea to be an emancipated woman was to reject femininity. And that space I'm, and that energy. And I mean, Twiggy definitely came out of that. If you can burn your bra and never have to buy another one, you you are missing a... Liana, I think you know what I'm trying to get at. Well, yeah, the relationship with bras is definitely one of those things that unless, unless you've lived it, <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> you don't know, man. You don't know. That shit's expensive. Also, I took mine off too quickly yesterday. Oh, did you get dizzy? 
it hurts. Yeah. Oh, the blank. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. Under the arms. <laughs> Oh, everybody yeah. everybody at home is going what's going on my see this is one of the things that people say we need these conversations we need to be <sighs> hearing this stuff because this this is the real shit yeah. i mean i can put my bras on a grown man's head and it looks like a keeper okay it looks like a yarmulke <laughs> that's how that's how much is going on there and and so yeah i i have noticed the um the 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 demonization of particular forms and that's not sex positivity that's not gender positivity that's self-loathing coming out especially when it's a, a female creator well shira was not she was not run by a woman and that makes sense oh my god i you can tell i feel so much better it makes more sense it's like, oh my god I, i'm so i'm so it's because it's the same it's it's the same thing. Remember I said about House of the Dragon, there doesn't seem to be a shred of authentic feminine experience in this, mm -hmm. except except for the um the actress who played Alicent. I think you know, she rejected the note mm -hmm. from the showrunners and went her own way. And I, yeah. I I applaud her for that. I think I think the character turned out better. Yeah. And, and oh, yeah. Uh the second to last episode where Viserys dies and there's the fallout and like yeah. Alicent finding that one was written by a female writer okay and it's not exactly the strong no, well, she just, but this is this is what I mean about no shred of legitimate feminine experience just because something's written by a woman doesn't mm -hmm. mean it's a woman who understands what's happening to her yeah. And, you know, part of it and part of why I don't like the she reboot design is that's not what I look like. Right. And it, it I don't want to go, oh, representation is, every, representation is everything, but it does matter. And when I keep seeing these designs that are, like, I, I posted a picture of myself on Twitter yesterday. You did? Well, a, a week and a half ago. By oh, the okay. time this comes out. Um, I got the purple dress. Oh, great. I'm going oh, okay. to have to send you the picture. Yeah. Um, so I got this uh early 60s style purple dress it's very fabulous it's That's historically gorgeous. accurate pigment it's so good oh, it's oh so God. good it's, yeah it's from the vixen uh edward scissorhands collection yeah so it's called the avon dress and it's oh yes oh I'm nice so okay. happy to have it um i but i posted a picture of myself and a few people saw me who'd never actually seen me before and they were like y you don't look real because <laughs> I've, I've had someone say I look like an anime character. Oh, interesting. It's very like the, the hip to waist very, ratio thing. Yes. Yeah, I get um, that. Too. Like the corset helps, but it's also just the bust. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Yeah, <laughs> like, there's a reason I love Jessica Rabbit. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> what that's why I don't like um, the whole thing of real women aren't shaped like that bullshit. You just don't, you know. Uh, we can't help the way things grew and mm -hmm. why should we have to hide like why should we have to um you know wear shapeless things because it quote unquote makes somebody else uncomfortable that I hate that that throwaway of oh it makes me uncomfortable or it's inappropriate based on what and for who and how do you think wearing something shapeless makes me feel well, yeah, it makes you feel blah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's, it, and that's why I like, it's, I prefer Marilyn Monroe to Twiggy because it's like, at least there are those curves. Well, and a and, lot more substance in a lot of ways, quite frankly. <sighs> yeah. You know, uh, the Dita Von Teese, the burlesque dancer, mm -hmm. has a quote where she talked about how you know she would look at modern magazines and everything would look so natural and so effortless and she's like I can't do that I don't look like that but then she would look back at the classics and the 50s vintage and everything where it's all constructed mm -hmm. where it's like it's the red lipstick it's the eyeliner and it's deliberately curled hair and nothing looks natural it looks like you took the time and put the effort in and she was like I can do that and you know that's what's something I you know what's mm -hmm. funny is those quote unquote natural photo shoots. Oh, they're not natural at all. It it can sometimes take more time 
to do that makeup than because I mean, you know how it is. Eyeliner, lips, the the shadow is not terribly complicated or blended when you're doing that because it's just mm -hmm. sort of uh you're you're getting the contour, but it's the liner that really carries the look. In a lot of ways, that is faster. I have and my makeup done in 10 minutes. When you get it down, when you get the muscle memory down, that's yeah. part of the reason I do that look for camera so often is it's just so much faster than try to balance a neutral color palette face. The beachy hair is such a pain in the ass and it feels gross. I don't care what anybody says. That product feels gross. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Ugh. And... I love the classic look. And personally, I think I'm one of those people. It's like, if you don't look like you put some effort into your appearance, like if you don't look like you tried to look good, not that you actually have to look good, but that you don't at least try. Yeah. I am going to judge you for that. Because to me, it's, I respect the person I'm, I'm facing and I respect myself enough that I take the time to make sure I look my best. That's what the uh, dating coach I interviewed for It's Not Therapy said that about men, too. And is, see another, uh, you know, you don't you don't have to look like magazine worthy. Just look like you took some pride in things. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, that was another reason why I wanted to talk about criticism was because mm -hmm. I see a lot of people and I see this both in people when it comes to like life advice and also in artists where they'll come up with someone will give criticism and they'll come up with an excuse yeah and it's like oh well my life has been like this or that or okay it, when it comes to art it's this is my style well yeah. your style sucks and you need to get over that because you know I've, I've been there where it's like I wrote something and someone was like well that doesn't work it, it just and they weren't saying it that bluntly but it's like look it's you need to work on this idea. And it's like, but this is the story I want to tell. Okay, sometimes you need to step back and realize the story you're, t you're trying to tell might not be the best one. Right. Especially when you're learning. But there comes a point where it's, you really, it, my thing with critique, because another Dita Von Teese quote actually is, you can be the ripest, juiciest peach in the world and there will still always be someone who hates peaches. Yep. And I love that quote. Because it's so true. And it comes back to what I said last time about, you know, 25% of people, people will like you. 25% of people never will. The other ones can be convinced one way or the other. Yeah. And, it, and also that Stephanie Meyer quote where it's like, my stuff isn't for everyone. And I know that. And, you know, part of my struggle has been, it's like most of, most of the people I know are guys. Mm -hmm. So they're like, well, yeah, no, I don't really want to read a fantasy romance. And I'm like, if you gave it a try, I bet you would like oh, it. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> name, name me a Marvel character that isn't a fantasy romance. <laughs> it's such a differently. I'm sorry, man. Yeah. Spider-Man's a fantasy romance. <laughs> Which is why about... everyone got so mad at One More Day. And they're still mad. I'm still mad about One More oh, Day. Oh, I, yeah, I, um... <laughs> I found out that Dan Slott blocked me on Twitter and I did not care. He actually ended up unblocking me because people shamed him unblocking me, but I didn't care. Well, I mean, Dan Slott wasn't even the one who wrote One More Day. Uh, J. Michael Straczynski was forced oh, oh, to write it. Oh, right. But Slott did some other things that I'm like, I yeah. don't care. He blocked no. me. I don't care. Other <sighs> people upset me, but him, it's like, nope. But he unblocked me. He's a nice enough guy. But mm -hmm. what I found out, I'm just like, but that's the thing. Like, we all have people's work that rubs us the wrong way. Yeah. Right? I think Tom King's probably, is that his name? I think so. Uh, Probably a lovely guy. His stuff is most modern big two comic stuff is not my thing. I, I think Tom King has some stuff he needs to work through. Yeah. Just going off the bat cat wedding. That yeah. Happened. But it's like the the issues that it went on and on of both of them just so deep in their own heads. I'm like, I, yeah, yeah, honey, go talk to someone. Yeah, you clearly need to. And and that's the other thing is you have to be really careful that you're. I mean, everybody puts themselves in their work, mm -hmm. but there's work and then there's therapy and the stuff you do for, for therapy probably you shouldn't put it out for public 
consumption because it'll just hit too hard. Yes, there's, you know, there is the the idea of using your own experiences. And, well, I use my own experiences all oh, the yeah. time, but that doesn't um, make it therapy. Yes. Yeah. So, like, I I have one character named Carolyn who she mm-hmm. is just absolute romantic, and she's a bit of a disappointed romantic in the beginning. And so when I wrote the first few chapters from her perspective and I sent it to my best friend and he was like, this was easy for you to write, huh? And I'm like, that, this was actually very cathartic. Yeah. <laughs> and she's still easy to get into because it's like, I understand that so much, but it's also, it's something I've worked through and I've dealt with. So it doesn't feel like I'm bleeding all over the page. It's just that I'm bringing my own experience, which gives yeah. a level of realism to it. Yeah, and I mean, I, Solomon's the same way for me from Boss Fight. He's basically me in college, mm. which is so funny why so many guys, so many guys connected to him. But, you know, I was trying to say all the right things. I was trying to be in with these like feminist crowds and interdisciplinary studies. And I finally just went, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't be this thing. I have to be this other thing. And, um, I think that's the difference between writing therapy and writing something that's just based on your own experience, but you're not too close to. Yeah. Is the fact that you can, you can have a perspective on it that you can't when it's something you're doing as a cope. Yes. And it's, you know, they talk about write what you know, and some people take that too literally and some people just don't get it at all. Like I've well, seen people say, well, if people only wrote what they knew, then we would never have science fiction. And it's like, that's not the point. Writing what you know doesn't mean only writing your experience. Yeah. Because sometimes you don't understand what's happening to you. Like the she show. <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's funny because back in the day, in was it the 90s when Jagged Little Pill came out? Yes. Alanis, Alanis Morissette was the Taylor Swift of her day. Well, what's ironic is because that's actually how, I just remembered that's actually how we got onto the subject of Taylor Swift was because I I came I came in swinging one day <laughs> into our DMs and I'm like, okay, here's an essay on Alanis Morissette. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my frustrations. And one thing I specifically remember is she has a song called Hands Clean which yes. is a, about um, being groomed and abused uh, by someone in the music industry. Uh-huh. And like, it's a great song and it's well-written and it's catchy, but like, I can't listen to it. Well, I'm like th- that cause, and this is why I said she was a Taylor Swift of her day, right? Mm-hmm. Because she wrote songs about her relationships. I mean, Torch is about Ryan Reynolds. But, really? Yeah. Um, and when you ought to know came out. It's one of the, the I know it's one of the guys from Full House. Yeah, Dave Coulier, apparently. The blonde and, one. Yeah, the guy who does Jackalope. So I, we had to all think of Mr. Fast the Fast Caboose, I'll never catch me. Getting a blowjob in a movie theater, right? I I always thought it was uh I think Uncle Jesse. I'm sorry, I don't know the actor's name. Oh, John Stamos. Yes, John Stamos. That I was no, because I think I think Cooley is Cooley might be Canadian. I might be wrong. I mean, Ryan Reynolds is. That's why, like, yeah. the Canadian industry is very incestuous. Oh no, he is. I American. can tell. Okay, he's American, but um, you know, the, it's that uncomfortable thing with if you're gonna do. I mean, it's not you're so vain that she you know kept the actual identity a secret when people actually know now I, I don't know why guys would get with somebody like taylor swift who you know there's gonna be a song but it was really kind of hard to sit with that it was so personal right and it's clearly only one person's side yeah, and that well. was the thing about your so vain. Like, I believe it's been speculated that it's about James Taylor, but like, she always claimed it was about several different guys. Yeah, yeah, and and if you look at the which way makes, the song, 
that was always what I thought. It was yeah. more than one person. Which makes a lot more sense because I was always like, well, you're so vain, you probably think the song is about you. And I'm like, but it is. And then I realized, oh, if it's supposed to be several guys, then all those guys are sitting there assuming, oh, right. it's about me. Right. And I'm like, okay, that's clever. <laughs> but but to me, I always took you're so vain to be, no, this isn't about you guys. The song's about me and my mm -hmm. perspective. And that's what made it poignant. Yeah. You know, and I, I do think that when it comes into this speculation of who's the song about, if if a guy, I mean, there was a lot of, uh, there was some controversy when Justin Timberlake put out, what was it? Was it Cry Me a River? Cry Me a River. And it, he it's... cast an actress that looked a lot like Britney Spears. I mean, everyone knew it was Britney Spears. Yeah. But... I mean, they were such a public couple. There was such a different response to him doing that than he can apologized for it since. Yeah. And then that. you you listen to Aerosmith songs and those are clearly about very specific people. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, people talk about, you know, oh, well, Taylor Swift, she's she's criticized because she's a woman who writes about her songs. Well, one in all she made a cottage industry out of it because mm -hmm. in her liner notes in the lyrics she would have special messages hidden that would give a hint of, of who it was about and <sighs> in also in those liner notes at the she would write a little note to the listeners but the last line of pretty much every one was and to all the guys these songs are about i warned you see that's where i'd be like okay that's and vindictive and see, that's that was one of those things that started to draw the line for me. But something something that frustrates me is it's like, OK, so her first and second album, it's, oh, this guy broke my heart. How could he do this to me? And especially since it was stuff we were seeing in the tabloids, basically, like Joe Jonas breaking up with her via text. Right. And I'll get back to that in a second, because I realized it's part of a trend with her. But and but then you get to the third and fourth album and especially as she started going more pop where that was when people were like okay she can't just keep whining about all these boys who did her wrong and for me a key example was you know a little over a year ago i believe she released this 10 minute version of one of her old songs called all too well yes yeah with a 15 minute music video and yeah. apparently it's about her relationship with jake gyllenhaal Oof. and i believe what's in the video i absolutely believe he was that awful to her i believe it's true however you know it's oh i turned 21 and you weren't there and how could you do this to me and it's still that kind of i was the innocent young girl well but also and maybe like, he was working and i'm like well the video specifically depicts gaslighting which but i'm like okay that's that's tragic but do you remember when you were 19 writing about john mayer doing almost the exact same thing oh so your argument is she's not learning She's not. And I think that's what a lot of critics were trying to say. But pe she and a lot of other people took it as, oh, people are just giving me a hard time because I'm writing about my relationships. No, you, I'm personally for me, it's because you seem to have this self-destructive twi twist or self-destructive streak. There's the word. Sorry. And something I've noticed is it's like, Okay, this one is a really personal point for me, and I've told you about it, but it's... Mm -hmm. Okay, so on her third album, Speak Now, there's a song called Enchanted. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the two clues in that one was, one, it was the name Adam, hidden in the lyrics. Okay. And she said that... She used the word wonderstruck, which she said this guy used, and it turned out it was Adam Young, who is Owl City. Okay. Um, the guy who did the Fireflies song. And it was this really sweet song that it's there I was again tonight, forcing laughter, faking smiles, same old tired, lonely place. And then she turns around and she sees him and the chorus and the bridge are literally, please don't be in love with someone else. I was in love with you. Yada, yada. It, mm -hmm. It's really sweet. And then it came out, it was him. And he had a huge crush on her. Mm. 
And so oh, for Valentine's okay. Yeah, so for Valentine's Day, he did a cover of it. And it was it was a response saying, and he even changed the lyrics a little to Taylor, I was so in love with you. Mm-hmm. And apparently they had met a couple times, they'd tried to work together, mm-hmm. and she never responded. Um mm-hmm. Months later in an interview, someone said, so did she ever get back to you? Did she ever respond? And he was like, no, I I never heard anything from her. Mm -hmm. And that was actually the start of what I would call his weakest era for the next few years. Mm. He'd been really thrown off his game. And I'm convinced it was her fault. (laughs) But but like, okay. So I can't have been a series of those things, right? Yes. So I I, I compare that to an artist like Adele, who also started real young and tends to write breakup songs. Yeah. But the stuff on her last album is the breakup song of a woman, you know, much older and wiser that she's owning a lot of it in a way that wasn't necessarily on 21. Yes. And that's refreshing because I'm listening to and it's like, all right, I've sort of aged along with her (laughs) and I really appreciate People hate easy on me, but I appreciate the lyrics of that song. I do too. And yeah. I guess, so it's like part of why I take that Owl City thing so personally is because at the time it happened, I actually had a crush on Owl City. Oh, okay. So that's why I'm personally invested in it all these years later. Um, but in her recent Bejeweled video, she played a clip of Enchanted. And part of the story in that video is that she she was a Cinderella who the prince got tired of her so he sent her back to her stepmother and stepsisters and I'm like if you want me to feel sorry for you don't play Enchanted right now (laughs) you're just making me mad and why why would she want still and this is this like perpetual victim syndrome with women she's 32 now now I will say so after we started talking about her a week or two ago, I actually went back and I listened to all the more recent albums because I mm-hmm. hadn't listened to anything since like Reputation. I finally listened to the folk albums and I really enjoyed those. And I listened yeah, to- Yeah, I like those too. One. Yeah. Yeah, I listened to Midnight's. Not quite as good. I, I'm a sucker for folk, folk mm-hmm. music. And I'm like, okay, it seems like you are starting to gain some self-awareness because, you know, we talked about the Tom Hiddleston thing. Yeah. Which- wow I, I I when that when that picture come out I'm like oh, no 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 no. what are you doing what are you doing well, run well, run 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 what are you doing I, I find it fascinating that like even on the reputation album when she did the song for him which is getaway car it was all right. just oh well I wanted to break up with Calvin Harris but yeah. I needed a reason so it, it's this whole Bonnie and Clyde story of like yeah I took the money and I left and you didn't see it coming and sorry and I'm like oh so you're using him just the way you complain all these guys use you and yeah but then now on the midnight's album she came back and she's like okay you wanted a bride i was making my own name and i'm like okay i think you're starting to realize well, it. why I'm- is he the only guy that comes out looking good in a taylor swift song <laughs> <laughs> because he's actually a good guy this guy plays this like the narcissistic man boy son of a bitch in, in real life he's just like too perfect what? for taylor swift what yeah. well it's it, it's interesting because you know we just talked about bad boys yeah. in the last series and she she loves that image she she has at least one song where she mentions name drops james dean and so i'm i get the impression she's a sucker for the bad boy and this whole idea that love needs to burn hot you know there's that whitney houston song i need a love that burns hot enough to yeah. last and i'm going no 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 the hotter something burns, the faster the lost, it yeah. goes out. You want something that will be slow and steady. It's It might not be as exciting and it might not have that thrill of danger that we get from the bad boy or the bad guy pretending to be the bad boy, but it's much safer. And you can see that in a lot of her music. It's very much, oh, the dangerous guy and this burning passion in the spark i love her song sparks fly but i'm also like that is a completely unhealthy thing to be- but, base but a that's relationship the thing on. if you know what you're getting into like when she's 19 yeah all right but now that she's getting older and it's it, you gotta you gotta take some accountability for your participant you know 
she hit her 20s that people started to say, okay, she needs to mature a bit. And, yeah. and I, I do think people were too harsh on the the number of boyfriends she had that she's it's not outside. She's a, you know, serial one relation. Oh, plenty of people do that. That's not strange. Yeah. I it, it's the, the she had the, the disadvantage of being so much in the public eye. Well, and making her relationships in the public eye. Right. Yes. I mean, some people are are very low key mm -hmm. about it. And that, that that's that's a different kind of heart. Right. Because there has to be someone who is prepared to not, you know, go out in public and do that yeah. stuff. And well, that it, that is difficult. But that seems to be how she's handling her relationship now. She's been with a guy since 2019. Yeah. She's been with uh, a Joe Alwyn or something yes. like that. Yeah. And, and, and maybe that's why the folk album was better. I don't know. Yeah. And you know, th there was an, uh, an acceptance speech she gave a while back that it was, you know, people complained. I was doing too many songs about breakups. So I wrote a song about going to New moving to New York. That song is a disaster, by the way. Mm -hmm. I used to like it, but then I listened to it again the other night and I'm like, this is disharmonic yeah um but she talked about how like she kept trying to change her music to appease uh, appease the critics and it's like honey you this is a completely unrelated comparison but you are tom hiddleston at comic-con i have an army left. right right you told apple what to do right basically yeah. you told scooter braun to get lost basically yeah and that's ironically Tristan did a review of her song the man when it mm -hmm. first came out and it's all this well if I was a man people would say I just played the field and mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had to work as hard as I do and again I'm like there are men who dream of having half the power you do then she did the music video and it's this she's she's dressed up as a guy and just being an absolute jerk and it's like okay but if you were a man who behaved like that we would all say you're awful yeah and I mean I think no one actually pre likes that guy this is a bad comparison me too yeah well <laughs> does maybe she likes that guy like I said she likes yeah. the bad boy yeah and so like I said I, th I think she's moving beyond that but you know there is that it's and, you know, we t mentioned in the last episode, uh, Shake It Off, which mm -hmm. Shake It Off, I like the idea. Yeah. But it's I'm a fun also, song. It's a it, fun it song. Yeah. But I'm also like, okay, so you're shaking off the haters. You don't care what the critics have to say. Do you remember a couple albums ago when you sang a song called Mean about how you don't care about the critics? And I then, don't. And that's the thing. I hate those songs because everybody yeah. cares. Yeah. And she's got like three or four of them. That's all about, well, you can't drag me down. And it's like, if you'd done one song, that mm -hmm. would have been something, but you keep doing it and you care so much. Yeah. About Everybody cares. Everybody and cares. And you know what? It's okay to care. I hate this paradigm that, oh, it doesn't bother me. Yeah. And it, it's, but it is also, it's like, okay, I get as an artist, I get it. But at the same time, it's again, you have an army. Taylor Swift fans scare me. Yeah. Especially the way they're just like, I saw, I've been listening to her song Ivy on repeat this morning and I saw a comment on it. Life is too short to pretend you don't like Taylor Swift. And I'm like, one, stop telling me what to think. I love and I hate her in mm -hmm. almost equal measures. Leave me alone. <laughs> it's just the fans who are just like, oh, and they, they go into this. And I, I think it is very kind of pop feminist mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, all these bad things only happen because she's a girl to an extent there's some of that but again eventually you have to not care about the critics and the fact you give them so much attention just gives them power over you and like that acceptance speech where it's like oh I wrote this song and then I wrote this song and then I wrote this song and it's like you you can't cater to them because it's it's like that Stephanie Meyer quote what I make is not going to be for everyone. Yeah, nothing. And I think is. she struggles with that, and it, it's something I think a lot of um, actors, especially, 
and people in the public eye like that, they do struggle. It's like, oh, why doesn't this person like my thing? Well, they're just not your audience. Well, you, you got to understand that in order to be anybody, you have to make people like you. I, I will remember to my dying day that thing I did when I was trying to find a PR person. And one of the questions I had is, what do I do about, you know, these people who have a preconceived idea of me based on things I can't control, you know, the narrative spun, but, and she just said, make them like you, you cow. <sighs> and I'm like, first of all, I'm not going to have somebody representing me who calls me a cow to my face. <laughs> yeah. Second of all, um, it's not my job to make them like me. This is why I'm talking to a PR person, <laughs> but it is, I, part of the reason I stepped away from acting, I love acting and I miss it, but mm -hmm. that I never connected with that make them like you thing. It was a really, really toxic headspace for me. I, I was one of those people who was all about the work. Yeah. And it was all about the craft and the process and the people I was working with and, and that really cool collaborative energy i was not about make them like me you know i was going to show up and i was going to do my job and i was going to be cool to the people i was with but this wasn't about me this is about the character and the work and the project but that's a minority in the industry yeah and so i get i get the vortex you know, but I, I do think, again, it's, you know, the, the similar thing I was saying about Will Smith. He's either not listening to his people or he's being poorly advised by his people, because at this point. You know, I mean, I, I again, going back to Adele, when it was that huge promo thing and she was on Oprah and people were slamming her, you didn't hear a peep out of her. Yeah. She just kept doing her thing. And I mean, Mariah Carey's really embraced kind of her kitsch camp, like that thing she did in the witch oh costume. My, oh my God, that video was brilliant. That was really, really good. And, you know, if Mariah can learn to laugh at herself, then Taylor Swift is going to have to kind of evolve or be left behind. Because that yeah. is, I think we're sort of hitting that point. I'm going to say something kind of, contentious and this is just sort of a workshopped opinion I, it's not a hill i'll die on mm -hmm. but i think we've come to a point post me too where women are getting sick of the constant victimhood narrative and I am. and we're looking for the ability to sort of be a, a there's a reason there's been a 90s revival as well because 90s was warts and all stuff mm -hmm. for a lot of female characters and I, I think that's the thing that was has been misrepresented about some of the female comedies that have come out is these are not people bemoaning their experience like a Taylor Swift song this is people laughing at their experience and showing how they're somewhat um responsible mm -hmm. for the outcome but I mean, that you start even mentioning properties that are like that and you get guys screaming at you and it's like, but this isn't for you. This isn't about you. And then you get people screaming at you because you said it wasn't for them. And it's like, it, if you're not seeing the woman taking responsibility for her part in it, then you're not getting that message and that part wasn't for you. What is so hard to accept about that? Yeah. And, you know, it, like I said, I write romance. Yeah. And I know, despite the, I mean, most of my readers are actually guys. <laughs> that doesn't, weird. That, I think that's good. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm still like, okay, how do I, how do I actually get women to read this? <laughs> but, you know what? Women online, it's, it, you have to be passive. You have to do the equivalent of shove it into their hands because women don't sample the way men do. Yeah. So, and well, we'll get to the volume soon enough, mm -hmm. but you know, it, it's, it just as a writer needs to understand not everyone is going to like what you do the audience also needs to understand not everything is going to be for you well and, and just, some things just don't come together as well yeah 
it, it's like legally blonde was not made with a male audience involved in mind no which is kind of ironic because i'm sure there are some people who would say oh there's male gazy bits in that because you know she runs around in a bikini at a couple points but <laughs> that's also just who l is because yeah Elle... it's funny i didn't take it that way i took it as that was the better than you scene yes well yeah. like i said i'm sure there are people who would see it that way but I mean, there are people who will misinterpret just about anything, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, people. I it, it's funny because that's like the opposite end of the turning red. I didn't get it. I didn't connect with it. Thing. It. I really do think that part of the problem with stuff now, and part of the reason that. Uh, creators go into this protective crouch regarding criticism is it is a fire hose and after a while you know that um that you go into a really loud room and you come out and your ears are ringing and you can't hear the person next to you talk even though it's quiet now yeah that's what it's like right yeah. and you do end up getting giddy and you do end up kind of sharing certain terrible comments and joking about it because it's just it's it's when this is not just your day-to-day reality but your hour-to-hour reality you do develop copes right and I, i don't know why people there's a general lack of empathy about this stuff and i i don't know it's unreasonable to expect that people are pelted with this stuff day after day and not expect them to to, to change, not have it change them in some way.